Winnipeg. Winnipeg is a winter city. Some call it Winterpeg. It's a hardy, determined city, born of agrarian roots. But it's also a stubborn city, a notoriously cheap city, a bargain basement city, wholesale city. It's a city with a slight inferiority complex. It's a city always looking to the west, always looking to the east. It's a city caught in the middle. My father came from Windsor, Ontario, and my mother followed the Commonwealth from India. I was born September 3rd, 1979, to that other Winnipeg. Now, the other Winnipeg is where the sun is always setting, where dreams end on the weekend, and where people bounce around, but they don't ever seem to go anywhere. And um, when I was young, I used to play this game where I'd take, I'd take two pennies, and I'd rub them together to make three. And I, so I'd take those worn out pennies, and I'd put them in a jar, and I'd try to save them up to buy a one-way ticket out of town. Every movie that I'd seen and every band that I listened to was from some other city. And everybody that I'd heard about that made it from Winnipeg made it out. Now, for some reason, I don't quite know why, uh, I decided to, um, to stay or to come back and um, I'd find my fortune in the West, as a lot of people did, and I came back and I went to school here to study architecture. But as soon as um, you know, any, any project or any paper was done, I'd pack a duffel bag and I would head the first day out on a bus back West. And I'd take any job I can get. And usually it was in construction. I would sleep on couches, I would sleep on floors, I slept in work camps, I slept in the bush once, beside the highway, and it was all better, in my mind, than trying to stick it out in a town I had no more stake in. But, so, when I'd returned to Winnipeg, and in a way I was a kind of an outsider, I kind of left for a while. I remember one time I was on the bus, and I was kind of staring out the window, and um, watching the prairie horizon ebb and flow, and start to, start to kind of, Winnipeg starts to emerge and start coming in. And um, this time it was kind of different because I, I remember seeing the buildings that kind of seemed like billboards. They seemed like cut in, stand ins and cutouts, uh, not really a city. But these billboards that I started to notice weren't selling soap. Uh, they were billboards of empty shop windows and four lease signs. And uh, it started to dawn on me that I wasn't the only one who left. Act two. So, I'm, it's about 2008, 2009, and I'm finishing my school, finished my master's in architecture, and um, a lot of people at the time would say, you know, this is, this is the best time to graduate as an architect. The world, you know, the, the economy is booming, you know, all this stuff's going up, and it's just it's crazy stuff. And, um, but at the same time, the, a lot of my peers, we kind of felt like, well, what? but here, how come nobody really likes good design, and, and why don't people really admire well-planned cities? And, a part of me, you know, we stewed on this, and I, um, I figured, you know, what's needed is a forum, is a place where, you know, designers, artists, architects could experiment and come up with ideas, and then and it'd be in the public, and the public could engage with them. So, um, just after this, uh, the recession hit, and uh, I realized this is probably not the best time to do this, and uh, a lot of people told me that it was not the best time to do this, and um, maybe it wasn't, but I did it. And I set out to, um, to start this sort of quixotic project. January 19, 2010, I was handed over the keys to what became Raw Gallery of Architecture and Design. And with a couple partners, we dug in and we stripped back layers and layers of this 100-year-old building. And every layer we peeled back would tell a story. The first layer was uh, grease, lots of grease from a greasy spoon diner. Then the next layer was sort of dusty paneling that was um, from, you know, maybe mid-century warehousing. And the last layer, as I was peeling it back, I remember peeling it off the ceiling and getting a face full of this kind of grist and grain, and it was, it was when it was about 100 years ago when there was grain stored. So I start this gallery, and 
I, I'm an outsider. I'm not really from Winnipeg anymore. I had been gone on the road. I'd traveled all over the world. I lived in the Arctic for a bit and the West Coast rainforest, I'd, and I'd traveled all across Canada. So I set up, and um, I started to realize that this is my first experience of the Winnipeg that a lot of other people would talk about. A Winnipeg with, you know, close-knit communities and, uh, you know, people helping each other out and uh, a sense of belonging. And I was an outsider again, and so I'm just soaking it all in. And I start to realize, like, you know, there's a, re there's a lot of really good work in this town. I mean, from the arts. And I started to, you know, wonder, well, why, you know, why do people always talk about other places? And I get these conversations going, and somebody would say, oh, you know, somebody's showing in New York, and da 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 New York, and whatever, in L.A. And I would, so I'd, I'd quip, you know, well, where's New York? Like, I, I've never heard of it. What's happening is here. And a part of it, I mean, I know I've been to New York, is, is kind of a boosterism, um, but also is, is earnest belief that the myth of your city becomes your city. Act three. Now, I had met Mandel Hitzer through a mutual friend, and um, they've been doing these pop-up dinners on rooftops and galleries and empty warehouse spaces, and the word on the street was it was the best food in town. Now, I just finished doing a pop-up uh, gallery on the street, and we met across the street uh, at a patio, and I pitched them this idea. I said, I want to do a restaurant. I want to do a pop-up restaurant, but I want to do it in the dead of winter and the middle of nowhere. And so that goes back and forth a bit, and then they finally said, you know, that's okay, let's do it. Um, so we decided, okay, we're going to do it on the river. Now, originally, it was going to be in a, a small, kind of tucked away area, and uh, we were going to do it for a long weekend, because we didn't think anybody would be that interested. So we, we planned it for like a long weekend, and, uh, you know, it would be a handful of people that would eat. But the, um, the project got shelved for about a year. Uh, Mandel opened his own restaurant. And I returned from a trip from London, and I went into the restaurant, and I said, okay, this is it. This is this is the winter we do this. So we, um, we set out a game plan. Wrote up a little schedule. I put my schedule, and I'll tell you why. Um, so again, we still didn't think anybody's gonna be interested. So we go, okay, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, closed. Or maybe we had this idea of like take out soups. You can skate up and get some soup. And <laughs> Thursday, Friday, Saturday, we'd have two dinners. And uh, Mandel would cook one of them. Uh, maybe the next day somebody else would do another one. And, um, and we figured, okay, that's, that's gonna be enough. Now the thing is, I wanna stop, can't stop the clock, but I'm gonna stop reading. I was, I was putting this together and I, uh, I scanned it. And I had never, I haven't read this sketch or this notepad in a long time. And there's one thing that stood out to me, it was like heat, wood, check the fire, check with the fire marshal. And a part of me is like, oh, I was so young. I was just so young. There's no way that's gonna happen. Anyway, so we took this plan, took this plan to the city. Um, we actually, we had chosen the forks uh, before we went to the city. And the forks, it's nice because it was like, it's, the, it's where Winnipeg began. And it's where people have been gathering for thousands of years. And it had a very, it had, it's like a charged site. Also, the head of the fork said, sure, let's do it. So we got this plan, same plan, and um, we go to the city. And, uh, you know, we sit around and, uh, and we heard this a lot. <laughs> you can't do this. And I was, well, why? And, well, you can't do this because this, this, and this. I said, well, well if, we, if, if we meet your requirements, can we do it? And then, you know, there's, I'm not gonna get anybody in trouble. But anyway, so we figured, okay. If we can meet the requirements, we get, we'll pay, we get one week, we'll pay for the second week, and hopefully if we get enough people in the second week, we'll pay for the third week. Now, I mean, we were a bit surprised. We were actually really shocked um, that we did have support from City Hall, and we had support from the city at large, and, and we actually sold out in a week. So, January 15th, 2013, start the building. Now, that's not a lot of time. But I had been a scaffolder in a past life, and one thing I knew is that we, these guys aren't, they don't do this kind of thing. So I figured, okay, I'm gonna stick it out, I'm gonna help them out, um, and uh, we're gonna build this. And we built it fairly quickly, but um, got a bit of frostbite. It heals. And so we're building it, and um, 
the kitchen was the last thing we built, and we, I kind of had to make a lot of it up as I go. And so the kitchen's built out of, um, it's like rickety pallets we just found, and we uh, put some plywood on top and uh, found some scraps of wood. And it's literally, we finished, we finished on the opening night. We finished the kitchen, so we're literally putting everything opening night. TV cameras are all there going, don't you open in like the three hours? Like, yeah, we open in three hours. So anyway, we um, had two elements, main elements in the restaurant. There's a kitchen, obviously. And then there's a table, and a table that everybody sits at. It's so one large table. It's a 30-foot table, and I was milling it from just regular lumber um, from, you know, a regular store uh, in the evenings after building on the ice uh, during the day. And I finally got, you know, everything milled, and I piled it all up, and I was like, there's no way. There's no way I'm building this and getting it down there. It's 30 feet, and it's a lot of weight. So I built it in sections, and we... We truck it down, we assemble it on ice, and we finally got it about, assembled at about 6.37. This is opening night. Dinner starts at 7.30. About 7.10, some guests arrive. A lot of guests, actually. And it's still on its back, just finished being assembled. And um, I figured, okay, well, well, it's 20 minutes, we can do this. So, but the thing is, it's, it weighs about 1,000 pounds. So I looked around, I said, okay, well, everybody, pitch in. So I asked them, the chefs, and I asked, uh, I remember the free press photographer, I was like, come on in. And uh, actually some of the patrons who were standing around looking, I was like, oh, let's go. So we all lined up, 30 feet, and we start lifting it. And it actually flipped from its back to the side, no problem. So I said, oh, great, this is really going to work out. Now, the, so, okay, we're ready to flip it onto its feet. And um, so we all, we all line up, count of three, we, we start trying to flip it, and it just starts sliding. And I was like, oh yeah, it's this ice. <laughs> so, okay, well, you know, everybody has their two cents. We're all figuring out how we're going to do this. When we tried it again, and um, it slid again. And at this moment, I remember feeling like, the, like sheer panic. I remember like my brain is exploding. And I'm saying, yeah, this, this is great. People are actually going to be eating on the ice. It's perfect. Anyway. Something in me, I guess, you know, in, in the panic, uh, I realized, well, wait a minute, we don't have to flip it. All we have to do, it's so heavy, all we have to do is actually just stand it up, and the weight of it will take it over. So uh, we all lined up again, and we lifted it, and it worked. And at 7.20, January 24, 2013, Raw Almond was born. Then the heaters broke down. <laughs> and the plates were freezing. And the cutlery was sticking to people's lips. <laughs> and yeah, and then, so we figure it out, finally get the heaters working again. And then about halfway through, the temperature spikes, and it's now zero. Went from minus 40 to zero. And I found myself before dinner pumping out what seemed like an Olympic pool uh, before everybody got there. The chefs cooked on butane stoves, portable butane stoves, and um, scaffold planks that were wrapped in tinfoil. But you know, some of the best food I've had came out of that kitchen. And in doing so, with all the collaboration, we ended up uh, creating a really nice, strong culinary art scene. Now, there was a couple rules. Chefs were given free reign to do whatever they want, as long as there's five courses. And there was brunch on the weekend, and the brunch had, a, had free reign as well, as long as there was coffee. And in a way, uh, the brunch, for me, was my way of giving back to that other Winnipeg. So, after all the last song is sung, and we're, you know, we packed all the gear up, and we, um, and we, uh, we left. About a week and a half after we finished, I had my first child at... Uh, 520, February 27, 2013, my beautiful baby girl was born. And um, for some reason, I mean, this is really, as you can imagine, a really chaotic moment for me. Uh, we just finished closing a business and uh, on the river and uh, having a child. And, but for some reason, I kind of have this way of blocking bad memories. So Madeline and I decided, let's do it again. And we did it again the following year. This time, doubling the space. 
flying chefs in from across North America. And one thing I got from this is that when you double the space, uh, you double the fun. And when you double the fun, you double the problems. But that's another story. So that brings me to my TED topic, cities. What's to be done? It's been noted that right now, uh, there's more people migrating to cities than and have ever done in the entire human history of civilization. And, um, and the stats are there, and, and I'd imagine it's true. But one thing that's always missing from the metric is qualitative. Like, what makes people move to cities? What makes people stay in certain cities? Why live in a city at all? And a part of it, to me, is uh, the stories. Is people move to st cities because of the stories, the stories that are passed down through generations. Temporary architecture has a way of, of capturing the best parts of cities and finding little cracks and, and capitalizing on it. And in a way, what I'm doing are creating vehicles for stories. And if Raw Almond was a success at all, it was really that is a whole bunch of different people from different communities got together around a table to tell stories. So yes, Winnipeg is a winter city. Winter pig, some people call it. It's a hardy but stubborn, cheap, bargain basement city, but it's also a city full of successes, and it's a city proud of, proud of its success. And the one thing I've learned from all of this is that the city you're in is the city you have, and there's more than one way to build a city.